And for reference, just so that we can all identify with them, these come from the time of the famous Norman explorer, René Robert Cavalier de la Salle, who sailed through the Great Lakes in the present day United States. He continued down the Mississippi River, and then he was assassinated in present day Texas about 10 years, give or take, before these pieces were made. Hi everybody. So today we have a pretty unusual and beautiful sight here, which are these outrageously equivalent pieces, 320 year old pieces made in Normandy. And as we begin, we should thank the expert who chimed in on both of these pieces, the mysterious administrator of Mublitz.com, which is a wonderful French reference site that really honors the art that some furniture was hundreds of years ago. But anyway, these two pieces fall into our repertoire of very fine regional work, which is different than normal utilitarian country furniture. And I hope, as usual, that this video will help people to better understand the difference between the decorative arts, early art pieces like this, and, you know, everything else that we ambiguously call antiques. So, what was happening in Normandy 320 years ago? And I couldn't even begin to tell you, but I do know that these pieces did survive the brutal winter of 1709. And at the very least, I can tell you what was going on in Normandy nine months ago, and that was that this piece was being removed from a small chateau outside of Caen. That's the city where William the Conqueror had his fortress when he was still Duke of Normandy before sailing across the Channel to become King of England. And that story is told by the Bayeux Tapestry. Wonderful thing that you should all see if you can. But anyway, although my associates didn't take great photos of it where it was, it's still pretty interesting to see this piece in an original period setting, an oak paneled 18th century Norman room. And now these pieces are emblematic of fine domestic furniture in Normandy around the year 1700, but they are also equivalent to one conserved in the Chateau de Martinville, the beautiful and terrifying Museum of Norman Arts and History. We can see this piece published in a number of texts on the subject of art furniture, also screenshotted from a virtual tour. And it is possible that all three of these pieces were made in the same workshop. Now, interestingly though, this one underneath the drawer is stamped with a maker's mark or perhaps an inventory chateau number, ALG. It would be interesting to ask the museum if theirs isn't also stamped with ALG. So Norman furniture is famous for this use of oak, but the glory days of Norman furniture don't really occur until about 50 years after these were made. And that's when we're going to see what this region is most renowned for in furniture history, a host of different taller two-doored armoires in a more curvilinear style, which are often elaborately sculpted from the different cities of the region. And just so you know, the quality of those armoires is often denoted by the number of roses sculpted into their doors. A five rose one would be considered the finest, most elaborate one. And so these pieces are compellingly early examples of Norman furniture. And we see that with these, we're dealing with 17th century furniture design with a much flatter architectural classical cornice featuring these friezes of consoles and then these crisper, closer together friezes of dentils beneath them. We also see, of course, the sides are straight and they're decorated with these little panels, simple but attractive coffers, we could say. And then we see the bun feet, which are typical of 17th century furniture. And while we are focusing on the feet, I'll mention that these pieces actually dismantle. The feet support a chassis on top of which we would rest the bottom tier, followed by the middle molding, the top tiers, which are heavier because they contain the pull-out drawers. And then on top, we finally stack the cornice. And of course, the pieces are built like this just to facilitate their initial installation somewhere because otherwise they would be immovable. So anyway, we don't really see any of the curves to the architecture here yet, but we do see that the sculpture here seems to announce that curvilinear style of the 18th century. And so that's why we would date these pieces to being right from around the year 1700 as they appear transitional between these two different centuries. Now, by my estimation, the sculpture here is the star of the show in terms of decoration. And these Louis XIV sculpted foliage motifs are sculpted directly into the mass of the wood. I think it's important to mention that because in our modern world, we are so surrounded by Victorian factory made antiques that it might not dawn on us that we're dealing with the work of a master carver here. This sculpture is not, of course, glued on. 
I will mention though that the band of sculpture across the top is sculpted into a separate slab of oak which is itself connected to the front of the piece, doweled on I believe. And that does evoke this notion that within a workshop at the time there would have been different specialized master furniture makers, one responsible a menuisier, a master carpenter responsible for the frame here, and then another who was a master carver. But I also think Practically speaking, that allows the carver to really hone his skill to complete that band of carving, such that if he creates an error, he could just remove that slab and replace it with one that is better executed. Now, over here, however, this truly is sculpted into the permanent mass of the case piece, and so thankfully there were no errors committed here because he wouldn't have been able, you know, to erase his mistake. Anyway, the sculpted motifs are inspired by the ornamentalist manuals of the day, such as the one written by Jean Bérin. And if we think back to the time, I think we could see motifs like this scrolling around in the hedges of a 17th century garden. Now we're about to check out the insides of the pieces, but I'll mention here that this one has a shell, which is very unusual. I've never seen that before. And while we're looking at the top, we can see how it's not only shorter than this piece, but it's actually missing the top layer of molding on the cornice. And that's sort of normal for a piece like this to have a few little missing parts in French, if 90% of the piece is original, it's still considered to be from, from the period. We'll also notice that it seems to have its feet replaced, if I had to bet, whereas this one has retained its original feet, if I had to bet. But again, we have to give pieces of this age quite a lot of leeway, especially when we remember that the published museum example is in fact missing its feet, and it's just resting on little pegs. So as we move inside the pieces, we note that they both have these rectangular layered recessions that denote high quality. And if we imagine these recessions not being on the pieces, we think of how with rare items, it's often these little details that the untrained eye might first overlook that end up accounting for major differences in value and overall success as a work of art. Now, when we move inside the piece, the first thing that we notice is how they have both retained their original Norman metalwork, whether it is these hinges here, or perhaps the key escutcheons, which are really typical of furniture of this variety, and the doors lift right off the hinges to facilitate, of course, moving this piece around, reduce some of the weight, and it's not good for pieces like this to ride around with their doors still on them, as rattling and vibrations are going to disrupt the way the hinges are fixed into the oak. But as we lift these doors up, we see that there is quite a lot of rust under there, some orange rust, and that reminds us of how Normandy is a very damp region. But careful not to allow this door to slam back down on the hinge, which would not improve it in any way, we open the door further and we see that the original lock has been retained here. And it still works, although it is a little bit loose. It needs to be fixed onto the door a little better. Might, might not be good to do that all the time, but the door uh, retains its lock. The lock still works. And as we come inside the piece, we see a very clever feature on both of these pieces, which is the hole in this front traverse, through which you drop a dowel. And the dowel is going to fall into the corresponding hole that's formed by a metal tab here inside the drawer, such that when the dowel is in place, well, the drawer is now blocked. And so when you close the piece and lock it, that allows for this drawer to be locked, even though it doesn't really present any keyholes, it doesn't appear otherwise to be lockable. So in terms of locking, we just release these locking bars inside, open the other door, and it's nice to see that both of these pieces have retained these original locking mechanisms inside. And these locking mechanisms, like a lot of the metal work on this type of furniture, they are as artful as they are functional. And the presence of them is part of that collector's checklist, right? Having these missing would, would sort of diminish the overall interest of these pieces. But since these are emblematic publication quality pieces, they would remain interesting whether or not the metal work is, is still inside of them. And that's something we really need to do first is determine whether or not the piece is an emblematic one iconic to the region before we then ascertain whether or not the metalwork is present because of course a boring chest which retains its original hinge remains a boring chest. But let's take a closer look at these as they appear almost to be silvered. We really need to thank the administrator again of Mublitz.com for bringing that to my attention. But as we look on the underside of this scroll here, 
we notice some sort of silverish metal where fingers have never been able to touch that remains here. And one would think that silver would in fact tarnish, but in any case, there is a brighter, whiter metal that appears to be plating these. Also inside here, we're gonna notice that there's a certain finesse to the practical interior of this piece, consistent with how this is really from a sought after workshop. Again, pieces like this, there's really nothing utilitarian about them. They are works of decorative art, even though the inside is going to be drier, it hasn't been waxed. Even though the interior is of course not, not decorated like the front, we see that they went to some trouble here to add a little bit of molding to these vertical boards. We can see some apparent doweling in here, which is charming as well. And if we look up underneath this one, we actually see some of the maker's marks in charcoal where he was noting down when the piece was separate and hundreds of little pieces, he was taking notes and reminding himself which pieces went where. It's kind of charming to see that that's still there 320 years later. One of the most interesting parts of well, this piece anyway, in terms of metalwork, is actually the metalwork that is missing from the piece. And we're going to see that right here with these little holes that are left by what I believe would have been an articulating steel candelabra that would have stuck out from the piece and then probably shot out at an angle to avoid encumbering the door. Now, if you have a better idea, or for that matter, any idea, as your guess is as good as mine when it comes to such an obscure question in furniture history, like, like what is responsible for these holes on this particularly specific type of Norman furniture from 320 years ago, if you have any idea, please leave it in the comments. But I do think that that is what we're dealing with here, the traces of a mounted candelabra. And we can even see a little indention here on the side post where I believe the candelabra swung. And in any case, that brings us back to a vast and damp Norman room in the middle of the night 300 years ago, where this beautiful piece would have been illuminated by a bunch of beeswax candles and a glorious fire hazard with these motifs a la Bérin shimmering away, perhaps in the moonlight as well. Domiciles that would have had four-doored, two-tiered armoires like this in Normandy long ago were very, very rare. And so, with that finished, why don't we go take a look at the unfinished parts of the piece, such as the tops here, which really remind us, show us, how back in the pre-industrial age, well, the makers didn't finish the backs because these date from a time when all this work had to be done by hand. So why go to the trouble to do that, you know, when only people like us are ever going to look up there? And this is not the case on post-industrial antiques from the later 19th century, which of course were made with the assistance of machines from start to finish. On pieces like that, we're going to see that the backs are rather uniform. That is not the case here around the year 1700 in Normandy. And finally, we notice that there is a color difference between these two pieces. That's simply a question of patina and the number of waxes that they've both received over the years. But why don't we take a look at this one before I re-waxed it? So you can see just how much of an improvement there is after a couple of hours of work, a few dollars worth of rags. And also so you can see that if you ever come across a piece like this and it looks a little dull and dirty, that in fact there's a lot of inherent beauty that's hiding there just waiting to be waxed. So everybody, I do hope as usual that you've enjoyed taking a closer look here and I will ask you to please subscribe to the channel as it will greatly help in this endeavor of slamming that door and screwing it up. It will greatly help in this endeavor of creating an online period furniture library of the most compelling publication quality pieces that I encounter, spreading a little bit of knowledge of the decorative arts. And as usual, I thank you very much for your time.